But thank you so much for joining us today for a really important discussion with Jami Hodge, who is the director of the Reshaping Prosecution Program at the Vera Institute of Justice. She joined Vera after serving for 12 years as an assistant United States attorney in Washington, DC, during which she handled local and federal crimes, tried um, more than 30 cases, and also served detail assignments in the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Policy, and also as an advisor for the Criminal Justice and Drug Policy um, in then Vice President Biden's office. She has worked as a community prosecutor, um, representing the U.S. Attorney's Office on criminal justice policy committees, and a variety of other community-based um, community um, positions. As the director of the prosecution reform program, Jami and her team work with elected prosecutors to help end mass incarceration and address racial disparities, um, particularly with prosecutors who are who've been elected on a reform agenda, which she will tell you more about. Um, on a personal note, I have known Jami for far too long. Uh, I realize it's been many, many years, and she, the same smile you see right now is was always on her face, even as a student. She is someone I have admired and respected from the first time I met her, and I've been thrilled to follow her amazing career path and really thrilled that she was able to take time out of her particularly busy schedule this, these days to join us and just could not be more thrilled to have her here with us. So. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Jami. Thank you, Jami, for being here with us. Thank you, Jill, for that kind introduction. And, um, and I would think to Jill, we were clearly babies more than 20 years ago when we met when I was in law school. So um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I love to talk to students. Um, I think now more than ever, we see that we need the ideas and the freshness and the brightness that youth and particularly students who are studying these issues bring to this work. And so, um, so I'm excited to talk to you today. I do have a PowerPoint that I'm going to walk through um, to give you an overview of our work, what we do in the Reshaping Prosecution Program, um, why uh, this focus um, that we have on ending mass incarceration, addressing racial disparities, and really helping prosecutors be more transparent, um, why this is just a, a part of the work that has to happen um, to change our system as a whole. And I think um, we see that now more than ever. I, I, it's amazing to me. I've been at Vera the last two years doing this work, um, but just how the last few months have made these conversations, um, national conversations. And so it's exciting for me to see um, some of the things we talked about six months that would never be possible actually happening in cities and states across the country. So excited to share with you. And then after I share the PowerPoint and tell you a little bit about the work, I definitely want to leave plenty of time for question and answer. Um, and I believe we're gonna do that through the chat function, but at that point, I'll hand it back over to Jill to help us um, navigate question and answer. So I'm gonna share screen now uh, with my PowerPoint. Okay. And um, so I work at the Vera Institute of Justice. Vera is a um, almost 60 year old nonprofit that has been working um, in the criminal justice space since its founding. Vera is known for using data to drive change. Vera is also known for being an inside lane nonprofit. We have amazing organizations like the ACLU and Color of Change and others who push from the outside on government institutions, but Vera has one that we, our work primarily is partnering inside. I will say primarily, although we've, we've also been shifting as government has changed to partnering often with advocacy orgs when we don't have partners who are willing to work with us for change. So I wanna begin just um, with 
our program and just a quick overview. So um, the reason that Vera launched this program a little over two years ago was um, a recognition that prosecutors, and, and it's not just Vera's recognition, we really saw in 2015 a recognition across this nation that if we want to change the criminal legal system, that one of the most important ways to do that is to change the lead prosecutors. Um, and that's because prosecutors, when you think about a criminal case, impact really everything that happens in that case. And yes, while there are some things that really are up to the judge, even for those things, prosecutors have a lot of influence on what a judge decides. And so this is um, just a quick snapshot of the critical decision points. Um, so from the point of arrest, uh, usually by police, um, and I'll name, we work primarily with local prosecutors that mass, the problem of mass incarceration in this country is overwhelmingly at the local level. Our federal system has less than 15% of the people who are in jails and prisons. And so the, the lead prosecutors that I work with that my team works with are elected prosecutors at the county and city levels. But this is just everything from, you know, whether or not to accept a case when law enforcement makes an arrest to what, how that case is charged. Is it a misdemeanor? Is it a felony? To what recommendations you make. Most places in the country use a cash bail system. Um, whether or not you divert that case out. So you recognize there's an underlying issue here that's better treated through substance use treatment or mental health treatment as opposed to a criminal response how quickly um, the person accused and their legal team gets discovery, which is everything related to the case, how fast you make that plea offer and move the case forward, what plea offer is given or if one is given um, is, is the prosecutor's decision. And then again, although the judges make the, the ultimately sentence the person who's been accused, it, it often is largely influenced by the recommendation a prosecutor makes. And this slide is just capturing the fact that what prosecutors do goes beyond, you know, their influence goes far beyond just individual cases. Um, how, what prosecutors think about issues, um, they lobby pretty heavily on legislation um, that happens across the country. And then just as, you know, being considered the lead law enforcement officer, they're influence is felt in everything from policing to what's available for victims of crime, um, immigration. There's a lot of overlap between what happens in the criminal legal system and in our immigration system, much of which I didn't learn until I came to Vera. And there are lots of unintended consequences that happen um, that impact the immigration system that you know we work with our prosecutors on. But the influence of prosecutors goes beyond, far beyond individual cases. And we know, again, um, that there's been this new focus on the role of the prosecutor. I would say, you know, 10 years ago, um, back when I did my details in the Obama administration, the big focus was on reentry. What do we do for people who have served their time and are coming home, you know, how do we set them up for success? And that's the way, if we can drive down recidivism, that's how we fix our system. And that was really, the focus was on the back end. I think there's always been a little a focus on policing just because they are the ones who interact mostly with the average community member. And so there's always been some focus on policing, but it's really only been in recent years, um, since 2015, that there's been this sort of more laser focus where you have advocacy organizations not just paying attention to who the prosecutor is but actually um, leading campaigns and helping to get different people who I mean literally we have lead prosecutors now who were never prosecutors they were DAs who ran on platforms of change and um, and I personally believe that this focus on prosecutors and what they do and how much power they have came from um, what we've seen and what we've seen even more of in, in recent weeks, which is the killing of unarmed black men by police officers. And when those were captured on videos, people like, you know, organizations like the ACLU would go to meet with the lead prosecutor and then be dissatisfied. They either couldn't get an audience or they, the audience that they received didn't really seem to um, care about the issues. Um, and that there really was this relationship between prosecutors and police that was more to protect police. And so um, that was really what began this movement to have 
to elect prosecutors who would actually hold police accountable. And I think that once they started to really understand, oh wait, this is a person who's elected, they serve at the pleasure of our community, we can have a say in who they are and how they lead, that they recognize that, oh wait, they control way more than just whether or not police officers are being accountable, held accountable. They control how many people come into our system. They control what happens to them once they're in the system. And it just opened up this real opportunity to look closely at prosecutors and then to use this important role to change our criminal legal system. So our program, and I mentioned this um, before, is really committed to three things. Um, our goals are to work with prosecutors to end mass incarceration, to address racial disparities, and to help prosecutors be more transparent and accountable. A lot of what prosecutors have done, do and have done in the past um, is referred to as a black box. Um, people don't know why a case is charged a certain way or why a certain plea offer may be given to one person and not another. And we never had to say why, you know, those decisions could be made inside an office and there was no real accountability for these decisions that would be so impactful on a person's life. Our work is largely done through site engagements. So these are 12 to 18 month engagements where we partner with a prosecutor who's been elected on a reform platform. And so, you know, that means that it's a platform that they ran on that aligns with the goals I just outlined as our program goals. And the reason our work is important is because you can imagine that even if, let's say, you have a former DA like Chessa, who just um, was elected, DA in San Francisco or Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, when you have a former DA or you have a, a prosecutor who ran on a platform of change and is now elected, that when they take over the office, they are taking over an office that has operated in a traditional law and order manner since its founding. So it's one thing to have campaign promises of change. It's a completely different thing to take over an office and expect to get different outcomes. And I say that because I worked under five different US attorneys in my 12 years as a prosecutor. And for the most part, the only thing that changed in my daily life was that the heading on our letterhead changed. I will name the very last administration did result in some significant changes, which was why I, I needed to go. But, um, but generally, you can have a lead prosecutor come in and it not change anything people are doing every day. So the work that we do is a deep, it's, it's technical assistance, but it's a deep technical assistance. Um, in that 12 to 18 months, we are using a data-driven approach and I'll talk a little bit more about this in further stat and further slides. Um, but it is. Um, but I, one thing I want to name here is that it was really important to me um, coming in to help build out this work that we had to engage line prosecutors that we couldn't just deal with the elected and think that we would see anything different. And that's why organizational change is so key to what we do. And then the other piece for me was while we have the goal of ending mass incarceration, um, I personally believe that we could not reach that goal without centering racial equity, that pursuing racial justice had to be um, in, you know, an integral component of our work if we truly want to work towards the goal of ending mass incarceration. This slide is just a quick overview of sort of the data related parts of our process. So um, I am not a data expert and thankfully I have amazing people on my team um, who are data analysts. Um, and so the researchers, so my team includes researchers and also um, policy analysts and then former prosecutors. And so we work together to do the work of a site engagement. Our site engagements begin with looking at the data. So you can have a hunch about what your office is doing, um, but that hunch, and we see this often, can just be wrong. So I'll give you an example. Um, an office that we partnered with told us that um, that on their misdemeanor cases that they regularly issue summons. So meaning that there's no bail required, you know, a person just re receives notice that they have to return to court. And, and of course on misdemeanors, we're not really asking for bail, we're issuing summons. Well, when we looked at the data, they were only issuing summons in 40% of their misdemeanor cases. And so, you know, they thought that the office was doing something, but that just wasn't the case. And so having the data and actually looking at what the office is doing concretely is really critical to being able to do the work of change. 
the data that we look at is um, it's an analysis of their case management system. So most, you know, larger prosecutors offices have an electronic case management system. And so we do a quantitative data analysis of that system. We also do qualitative data analysis by interviewing both staff in the office. Um, and now we've grown, we're piloting and growing a um, what's called power participatory action research based model, where we are now in, in engaging in using our qualitative data um, gathering and analysis to include community members and specifically those who are most impacted by the system. We do that data analysis and then we present findings to the leadership. We work um, closely with a working group in the office um, so that we have an internal group who are both our sort of partners in this work because we're outsiders. You know, Vera's based in New York. I'm based here in DC. We work with offices across the country. And one thing I'm clear about when we show up on a site is that, you know, we may have expertise on sort of national trends or ideas about policy change, but you will always be the experts on your own system. I will never know the judges here the way you do. I will never know your defense bar here the way you do. And so it really truly has to be a partnership that we work together with the site to achieve change. And so we take, we show those findings to the working group. We show those findings to um, the leadership. And then based on those findings, we workshop policy reform. So, and we will literally help an office rewrite their policies, everything from their charging policy to how they um, make sentencing recommendations based on what we see in the data. And again, based with those three goals in mind, how do we help prosecutors in mass incarceration address racial disparities and be more transparent. By implement reforms, this is the part I was talking about in terms of engaging line staff. It is not enough to help write policies and have a pretty memo that you send out without anything more. You will not get to change. And so doing the hard work of having focus groups and um, trainings for line prosecutors to get their buy-in, to get their thought partnership, and to also see what they need. What do they need to be able to do their job in a different way? And um, so that is a really critical piece of the work that we do in partnership with the site. And then finally, data isn't just important to help us understand the problem. Data is important to see if the work that we've done together is working. You know, so we use the data analysis to continue to track throughout our engagement and then post engagement that you know, these new policies, and now that everyone has been trained on them, are we seeing a decrease in incarceration? Are we seeing a decrease in racial disparities? And using that data to continue to help us go back and revisit where things may need to be tweaked. This slide is just a sampling of some of the places where we've worked um, in the last about, the I would say three years. The program launched in a pilot um, a, maybe about six months before I joined Vera. And there are a couple of places that we are going to announce um, in the next month or so that aren't on here. But just a quick snapshot to show that we work across the country. Again, these are all prosecutors who ran on a reform platform. So when I talk about training prosecutors, you know, what is it that we're talking about? You know, when we want them to literally reimagine their role. Um, one of the things that it was important to me to talk about and something that I never heard in my 12 years as a prosecutor was the term mass incarceration. I was told to do justice and to do justice, you know, to pursue justice, but that meant doing it in a case by case approach. The case I had before me to look at the facts and figure out what is the just outcome and do my best to work towards that. But I did that in a vacuum. I never had an opportunity to zoom out and understand how the work I was doing was contributing to this national crisis. And in a little bit in these slides, we're gonna, I'm gonna share just a few of the sample slides that we cover in training with prosecutors, but what was clear in learning was that we incarcerate more than any place on the planet. Um, we incarcerate nearly um, one out of every hundred individuals in this country. We have 2.2 million people cycling every day through our jails and prisons, um, and we are out of step with the rest of the world. So just being able to have that conversation, show them the data of how their cases are contributing at the local level, we'll compare that to a national level, and then we show that how that compares internationally and how incarceration um, has become the single tool that we overuse in our system. 
Then we also talk to them about racial inequity, um, which is just not something we talked about as, and during my experience as a line prosecutor. I certainly saw it. I was a prosecutor in DC where nearly 90% of the people who cycled into our system here in DC are black. That black people don't make up 90% of DC's population, maybe about half. So, you know, and that's not an uncommon experience. Anyone who's in court or in a criminal court every day sees this, they see it, you know, but there's never really any space or opportunity to talk about it and importantly to learn the history behind it. And then the other thing that we try to help them understand and really embrace is that they have an important opportunity to do something about it. They are working for a DA who has been elected to do this job differently, that their community has sent a message to them by electing this DA, that they want something different from their office and to encourage them to lean in to this real opportunity to change the way their system is operating locally. So this is just sort of an overview of what are some of the things that we have to almost help prosecutors unlearn um, in terms of why we've done the, done the job the way we've done it for so long. So the first is that incarceration is how we are safe, you know, that that is the way we keep our communities safe. Well, you know, what we're able to show, especially by comparing to jurisdictions here in the US and then again internationally is that if that was the case, if, our, if incarceration equals safety, we would be the safest place on the planet. We would not need to lock our doors. We would not have the crime rates that we have. And so clearly there's a disconnect. Um, there are lots of places um, where we see decrease in incarceration because of decarceration efforts at the same time as decrease in crime. And we show them those examples. The second thing that we want them to understand is that the system itself causes harm. Um, and I don't, again, think I ever had an opportunity to step back and think about the system um, and the impact the system is having, but it, it impacts more than just the individual families, communities, and be able to discuss those harms. The other thing that prosecutors often say is, well, you know, this is how I get justice for the victim in this case, you know, getting, asking for the longest sentence, getting that conviction, that's how I get justice, and that's how I make this victim whole. But what we recognize, particularly from excellent survey data, of victims is that this, and, and I will admit this as someone who worked with, you know, my fair share of folks who had been harmed and harmed in really significant ways, that the way I approached a case and the way that our system is set up to approach a case is that the victim is necessary for testimony to get a conviction. It was not a focus on what is it that they truly want out of the process? What is it that would actually help them to repair the harm that happened? You know, it was almost, we had some victim advocates who could help meet with maybe some immediate needs, but our focus was on the case. Our focus was on how do we get the conviction? It, it is not victim centered and there are better and other approaches that actually center the person harmed. And then finally, we have, we talk about the fact that when we look at our history and really understand how our system was founded and what the basis of the system was, then you can't um, not, you can't address the system and address the system failures without addressing racial inequity and centering racial equity in this work. So this is just an example of what I was talking about in terms of us incarcerating more than any place on the planet. Like that is what this slide is showing. It's global incarceration rates and we are the deepest red, nearly 700 per 100,000 people. Um, so again, we, we stand alone in the rate of incarceration that we use. And because we incarcerate so many people, it is something that now impacts nearly half of all people living in our country. And usually when I speak in front of a group, I'll ask people to raise their hands if you have a loved one, a family member who has been um, in the system and almost every time the majority of hands go up and that's in a room full of line prosecutors, it's in a, line, in a room full of community members, like we've, we're all impacted by the system. And then the next question I ask is who was better for it, you know, particularly people who've been incarcerated, who actually was incarcerated and came out better. And that's just not the case. Like we, we don't focus on rehabilitation, we focus on punishment 
and caging and and that's not changing and then we expect someone to come home and do something better and that just doesn't make sense so this is just one of those examples of a slide that will show um, where in New York there was a has been a sustained decarceration effort for many years and there's been um, near this shows a 57 percent decrease between 1991 and 2017 in the jail population but at the very same time that same time period there was a significant decrease in crime. And this is specifically major crime. So we're not talking about low level offenses, we're talking about violent crime. Um, the other thing that we talk about in terms of um, why incarceration isn't the answer and particularly pushing you know, about violent crime is that um, one of the, and there's an, an amazing book I'd recommend, Until We Reckon, by Danielle Sered. Danielle runs this amazing program. It is the first alternative program in the country for violent crime cases. So we often hear of an alternative to incarceration programs um, that are for lower level or misdemeanor or, you know, small, like uh, less serious cases. Her program, Common Justice, was founded and specifically targets violent crime cases. And in her book, she talks about and shares the research showing the core drivers of violence and their shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and an inability to meet one's economic needs. And so what we do in response to someone who commits an act of violence is we send them to jail, usually to prison, and where they are exposed to shame, isolation, they're exposed to violence, and they have an inability to meet their economic needs. And then we wonder why after someone has done a number of years, you know, that they don't come out, you know, different and ready to live life in, in a different way. The other um, thing that prosecutors really have a chance to think about is the fact that what happens after a conviction impacts someone's life in so many ways beyond just that criminal case. There's this national inventory of collateral collateral consequences that I recommend if you're not from Virginia or for those who may be here from zooming in from North Carolina or if you're from somewhere else, you're just in school at one of these places, look up your own jurisdiction. It's amazing what a criminal conviction can keep you from doing, but I did Virginia just for this and I think it was 791 collateral consequences came up. So, you know, again, um, if, the, if we are trying to address the harm and then make sure harm doesn't happen again, when we have collateral consequences that impact your access to housing, access to education, access to jobs, then how are we setting, and all of these things have been shown to contribute significantly to success and low recidivism rates. And if we hamper someone from being able to access those things, we are on this cycle. We wonder why we have a nearly two thirds rate of recidivism in this country because we, we hamper, we literally, you know, give people an anchor when they finish their sentence and say, okay, go swim. And these are just a couple of the slides um, where I mentioned or an example of one um, that from the survey data of victims. So this one is showing that by a three to one margin, victims actually prefer options that hold people accountable that actually treat the underlying issue over punishment. Um, and so again, just getting at that um, sort of misconception that this is the best way to serve victims is through getting the longest sentence I can. And to me, this is probably one of the saddest, saddest statistics about um, victims is that, you know, so many prosecutors take the job because they want to help victims. That's why they do what they do. Um, but to know that less than half of victims of violent crime even engage with our system at all, so that if everything our system has to offer, that the you that that your choices, I would rather not engage at all than to engage in this system, and um, because it just shows how we don't center the needs of the person who's been most harmed. And then these are just some examples of the slides that we use to talk to prosecutors about racial disparities. And so this one is showing that a black person is 3.6 times more likely to be incarcerated than a white person when we look at jail populations. 
This is an interesting slide that is basically looking at drug use, drug arrests, and drug sentencing. And just in short, it shows that although Black people make up 13% of the population, so this is comparing Black and white, and I'll name that for racial disparities, we primarily focus on the Black and white distinction. That's usually where there's best data, um, and also where we often see the, the um, most stark disparities. But that when you look at drug use in that next, um, the next uh, column, um, that drug use basically mirrors population. But then when we start to talk about arrests, we see that if you're Black, um, nearly while making up only 15% of users, nearly approaching 30% of the arrests are black people. And then that this disparity just increases as we get more serious. So in terms of sentence, not only are black people overrepresented as we get more severe in the punishment. So second to last is sentenced to state prison, the last is sentenced to federal prison, but that if you're a white person, your representation decreases. And so this is just, again, one of the many examples, and we're seeing so many more right now. There's lots of data coming out just in this national discussion we're having about racial disparities in our system. So then how did we get here and why does this exist? And I think it's critical that we have to begin with the history. And so this is just language from the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. And so when slavery was abolished in this country, we had a huge exception. The exception to the abolishment of slavery was except for as punishment for crime. And that is why Brian Stevenson, who I think was super famous already among criminal justice reform circles, but is even more famous because Michael B. Jordan played him in Just Mercy. Um, but he, he says that slavery never, it didn't end, slavery evolved, and that our criminal legal system has been the tool with which it evolved. And if we look again here at the very language, we can see how this started. And this is just, you know, in capturing in pictures some of the similarities we see that still exist in our system of mass, you know, our, our problem of mass incarceration in our system. Um, this just outlines some of the, again, similarities in the conditions. Everything from the use of shackles, um, from the dehumanizing language that's used to, to abusive interactions, the unhygienic living conditions. Um, there are so many similarities, the removal from family and community and loved ones, um, loss of rights, including voting rights in many places. Um, so just lots of similarities again. So I'm going to stop here because there's, I, there's more I can share about and, and want to share about our work specifically around racial disparities. Um, and so I will take just a minute to plug our Motion for Justice campaign. Um, so I, in our first year, maybe year and a half of doing the site work, and this is a pilot, you know, so our, our work at Vera, the reshaping prosecution program didn't exist three years ago. So it started as a pilot um, and, in, and that's Vera's model. Often we start as a pilot, we test it out and if it's working, then we scale it. So we're in a position where we're scaling now, we're expanding our work. But in that pilot, one of the things that we saw is, you know, after doing that data analysis I described, doing the hard work of like rewriting policies and training all the line staff and then going back and looking at the data to see, and again, this is, you know, 12 to 18 months, this is not a short period of time, we saw decarceration, we saw more transparency, but the one thing that has persisted was racial disparities. And it didn't matter that we were trying to have those conversations with staff. It didn't matter that, I'm gonna uh, stop share for a second. Um, it didn't matter that um, we were, we were talking to them about this history. Um, we still saw racial disparities persist, you know, run by, you know, again, these lead prosecutors who bought into this and want to tackle this. And so what we recognized, you know, surprise, surprise, an issue that has been so deeply embedded in our country since its founding isn't going to be addressed as sort of one of many initiatives that we're trying to push in a site engagement. And what we recognized is that we needed to launch an initiative where we where that was the sole goal where our explicit focus and sole focus was on how do we 
decrease racial disparities in our criminal legal system. And I, my thought was there are people who have been working on these issues, researching these issues, writing about these issues for many years, many smart people out there. We need to get them together, get them in a room, and we need to figure this out. And that was what led to our Dignity, Dignity Racial Justice and Prosecution Initiative that we launched last summer amazing folks at the table like Jeff Robinson, who's at the ACLU, um, Angela Jordan Davis, a law professor at American who's written on the power of prosecutors for more than 20 years and for specifically with an eye towards racial justice. We had lead prosecutors, we had nine different prosecutors offices, eight of them the lead prosecutors who either ran on these issues or cared deeply about these issues, including Kim Fox in Chicago, Kim Gardner in St. Louis, and some from smaller offices, not just the large city offices. And then we had people who've been directly impacted by the system, who've, who've served time, who have lived this experience. And then we had advocates who have been passionate and working on these issues. And we had a six month process where we immersed ourselves in learning the history. We went down to Alabama to the Equal Justice Initiative, me and Simmon Memorial in Montgomery, together as a group. Jeff Robinson gives this three hour amazing presentation walking us through, and I recommend it. It's called Who We Are, Chronicle of um, Racism in America. Um, he gave that presentation to help us walk through our history and really come to a deep understanding of how our history relates to the present system of mass incarceration. And then our work together was then what can we do about it? And how do we reimagine the role of a prosecutor where we center racial equity, where we divest from a system that isn't working and actually invest in the systems um, and, and in the um, amazing people who are doing the work on the, out in the community and on the ground to address the underlying issues that our system has become a backfill for? Um, and how do we centralize human dignity, um, which is not present in slavery. You know, slavery was based on the premise that black people were property and that lack of humanity, that lack of human dignity has carried through into our present system. And so how do we have a system that is responsive to harm, but centers human dignity? And those were sort of our guiding, guiding principles. And that work has culminated into a campaign we're launching next month called Motion for Justice, which is providing those concrete tools to prosecutors' offices, um, including policy recommendations and ways that they should do their job, um, ways to engage with their own community members to learn their local history and to engage them in how they jointly come up with a new way of doing this role and a new way for their office to serve their community. Um, and so, and we're going to, because we're Vera, we will pilot it in three places. So we'll take this guidance that we've developed. We have three offices um, that we'll be announcing next month who will then, um, we will implement as much, a, as much of it as applies to that specific office. And then we'll measure at the end, you know, did we create something that actually draws, you know, drives down this persistent, um, data point of racial disparities. And so, um, so I'm excited about that. And um, I will stop here. But I will share one more time just so that you can um, see, I have my contact information. So I want to put that up. Um, this is my email, jhodge at vera.org. Um, and just the link um, about our project at Vera. So I'm going to stop share and I'm going to turn it over to Jill for questions. All right. If, um, if someone has a question, feel free to either use the raise your hand feature or to put it in the chat. Um, we do have a question. Um, I don't know if you can see it too, Jami, from Cliff Keenan, who says that most prosecutors work depends upon arrests that police make. Oh, you might know Cliff, it sounds like. Um, and this Cliff said, I was also an AUSA in DC for 19 years and rarely had to prosecute a white person for anything. Should prosecutors decline to prosecute persons of color until there is a more equitable distribution of enforcement actions in a community? That's a great question. Hi, Cliff. It's been a long time. <laughs> um, I, so, you know, in short, they should be declining to prosecute things that don't deserve a criminal justice response. So, 
you know, we, you know, from being a prosecutor, anyone who's been in the system, there's so much that comes into our system that is tied to mental health, it's tied to poverty, it's, it's tied to substance use, it's tied to some other underlying issue. We bring them into a system where we don't, you know, we, we try in some ways to address, you know, some of the issues, but that's not largely the focus. It's more of a afterthought, um, particularly if it if that underlying issue led to something more serious. So if you're, we're now not just talking about drug possession, but we're talking about burglary, or we're talking about an assault, um, then our response is incarceration. It's not, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to punish. And so, you know, I think the answer is we need to fundamentally rethink what we consider criminal, you know, that our idea of what is criminal behavior needs to fundamentally shift. And that when we do that, it will stop so many people from coming into the system and that yes, the marginalized community and unfortunately often that's predominantly black communities who suffer from poverty, lack of resources, all of the issues that lead to people coming into the system are always are often exacerbated in marginalized communities that if we take that approach it's going to impact black people. I do think though that prosecutors have a responsibility to think very specifically, how can they combat the overrepresentation of black people in the system? And so some of the ideas I have around that are traffic stops, you know? So in our motion for justice campaign that will launch um, next month, one of the policy suggestions is we know there's an amazing project that was done out of Stanford that looked at 2 million police stops and the racial disparities in those police stops are stark. And in fact, that what they found in that analysis that white people were more likely to actually have contraband than black people, but black people are stopped at rates way higher than someone who's white. So one thing a prosecutor can do is stop rubber stamping traffic stops. Unless there is an identifiable public safety reason for that stop, you don't, I don't care what you find. You find a gun in there, you find drugs in there, you don't rubber stamp it, you know, you, you are only contributing to the problem. So I do think there are some ways that prosecutors can lean in very explicitly on addressing the overrepresentation of Black people. Okay, we have another question. Have you, as you're addressing racial justice within the criminal justice system, have you run into any issues about being race neutral and sort of unconstitutional for not being race neutral in your proposals? So, um, I, unconstitutional for being race neutral. I, not nece I haven't necessarily run into that. What I have run into is um, race neutral policies being offered as a response. So for instance, there's an office in California that is piloting this idea of blind charging. And so when a prosecutor gets the police reports and the criminal history and the things that they would normally have in front of them to make a charging decision, anything that's tied to the person's race, even like neighborhood, other things that might be kind of other uh, proxies for race are, are um, basically removed. And so they're asked to make the decision without having any indication of the race of the person who's been accused. I am actually not a proponent. I actually, you know, to me, um, what that does is allow the prosecutor's office to become a sieve. So what we know in terms of disparities that are happening in policing are then brought to your office and then you put on a blindfold and you just let those same disparities flow right through. And I think there's an obligation and, and a better opportunity to address it by actually knowing who it is, knowing that that particular zip code has way more police officers per block than the zip code across town where it's predominantly white, you know. So there, there I, the race neutral approach, I mean, I think there are lots of, lots of problems with it, but that in the context of prosecution, that's just one example of why I don't think that's the approach. Uh, we have another question. How can community members get best get involved in driving this change toward reshaping prosecution? I know you mentioned your initiative that's coming out and maybe you could talk a little more about that or some other some other opportunities as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, I one, you know, first of all, like know who your prosecutor is and vote. You know, so I, so many people just don't vote down ballot. They don't really pay attention to the kind of local, you know, aspects of the ballot. But the process, you know, recognizing how powerful your local prosecutor is and and how much they are going to impact your system and your community makes it critically important to know who that person is and to have some say. Engage with your local prosecutor. So don't just vote, but you know, part of what will be in the um, campaign that we're releasing are opportunities for you to, you know, draft and there'll be a draft email in the targeted cities that you can click and send to all the candidates for DAs in your in that particular jurisdiction. So that you know you are saying to them, I am one of your voters, I'm a community member here, and these are the issues that matter to me. I don't want the traditional response. It is not working for me. I want something different and I expect something different from the office. So engage with them. Um, and you know, and then yes, like if you as our motion for justice campaign comes out, although we're piloting in three offices, you know, our our hope is that a lot of time and effort went into creating something that I'm really hopeful will be very useful in this moment. And the best way for it to be useful is for it to get in as many hands as possible. Our primary audience for it is prosecutors. Um, so it's geared towards how do they use their role and use their power, but our secondary audience, our community activists and community members who can hold prosecutors accountable. So um, helping us spread the word about that is also a great way to be supportive. Um, did, our, we are open to more questions. I have a couple, but if uh, someone else has another question, feel free to raise your hand or type it in the chat. Here we go, from our Dean. Uh, I think the Vera Institute of Justice is a fantastic organization. Thank you for being here and the work that you do. Is there one piece of data or information that Congress might require local prosecutor offices to publicly um, provide, presumably in exchange of criminal justice resources, that would be the most helpful for accountability? I mean, I, that's a great question. And, I, and thank you, Ian. It's nice to be here. Um, it, you know, I, so there's, there's something you didn't ask that I also want to address in that question, but, um, but I, I think prosecutors don't do a good job of tracking data just across the board, you know, so usually when we come in to, I mean, you know, look, I'm a lawyer, I also hated statistics, it's the, it's the one C on my transcript, like numbers and data are like not my thing, you know, I've gained an appreciation for it since I've been, you know, at Vera, I now understand the power behind truly understanding what it is an office is doing. But, um, but, you know, most prosecutors who run for office, like that data is not their thing. So we've been horrible, really, as a system in terms of tracking. So even just beginning to track is going to be critical. Um, even in offices that we go in and work with, and we are picking offices that have electronic case management systems. They tend to be larger offices that have the resources. Um, they often still will have the system and aren't recording, you know, so they'll record maybe what the charge was and maybe they record what they pled to but they don't record what any of the plea offers were they don't record what bail was asked for or what the bail amount could they consider that a court function so uh, so just tracking data across the board is needed but i think if prosecutors had to publicly um express or report to congress their their racial disparities like that seen from each local office like this isn't just you know something that we're making up like it exists it exists consistently across the board would be an important step and then i want to just name in the, the in exchange for resources because that's usually the way the feds can get state and locals to do something but it is something that in this moment right now where we are hearing the calls to defund police and where people are starting to recognize that the money that we spend on in incarcerating someone. So often when we, I give this presentation, I'll include a slide that includes what it costs to incarcerate someone in the state versus the local state tuition. It is always significantly more. So there's the, the calls are right now like, look, why do we keep pouring money into a system that's not working? There, we know there are things that work better and though and those things are operating on shoestring budgets are under resourced. And so 
I would love for the feds to find a different hook than just money, you know, and, and that traditionally has been what it is. If you want state and locals to do something, you offer them money. But I would love for, you know, the, us to start to rethink either if that money is coming, it is for you to then, you know, to grant out in partnership with local partners on the ground who are doing the work. Um, but something other than continuing to pour money into our system. We have other questions out there. Um, I have a question. I we talked about this earlier. The work that you're doing, and even in learning more about the history of Vera, is is obviously very cutting edge, and involves taking leaps of faith and trying things. And as you said, sometimes you know you don't know that they'll even work, and which is why you pilot them. And as our students examine policy proposals. I think it's sometimes uncomfortable for them to come up with proposals that seem so outside the box um, and to kind of know whether it seems creative or crazy. Um, and so I was wondering about the process that you all go through at Vera to decide whether to pilot something and, and sort of just the mental and the actual process of deciding whether to take a leap of faith. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we. So I feel incredibly blessed to work at an organization that encourages us to be innovative to address world problems, you know, and world problems within a lens, you know, very specifically through the criminal legal system. Um, but, you know, we, that it is an expectation, you know, that we weren't, you're not just coming here to sort of, here's a manual, you're coming here to like create the manual of what it is that you want to do to address this problem. And, um, and yeah, that just requires us to be brave, you know, it requires us to be willing to think outside of the box. I think it requires us to envision something we've never seen before, you know, to really just um, allow ourselves to think about what justice could look like in a different way that centers those who are harmed that actually is about accountability, which is not what our current system about is about, although we say that. Um, that is about repairing harm. That is about helping communities thrive. Um, so that's, it's really exciting. We, at Vera, we do, we're, we're going through a strategic planning process right now, actually, where we're reorganizing some things, but one of, part of that process has been an idea pipeline so um, so that anyone across the institute, regardless of your level, whether you lead a program like I do or you're you know fairly junior right out of school or you're even in an administrative role, that if you have an idea that you can um, put it out there for uh, review for input and then for resources you know if that idea looks like one that we should pursue so um, so I, again, just incredibly grateful to work at a place that promotes this. But one reason why I love talking to students is because you are full of ideas and we need them. Like this is the moment right now where we have real opportunity to do something radically different than what we have in our system. Thanks. Well, I think we've got time for one more question. We have one from Professor Brian Williams, who does a lot of research in this space as well. And he, his question is, do you foresee more engagement between policymakers within this space with members of the public that are most impacted by the historic harms of the criminal justice system and helping to deconstruct and reconstruct a more just and equitable system and process? I hope so. Um, I can tell you for my work, it is something that the lead prosecutors that I work with, something I'm saying to them, like, you know, it's great that we have this moment because, you know, I'm on calls, I'm in meetings, and they're like, you know, okay, great, I can partner with, you know, um, different stakeholders or others who actually want to change and you know and I will say how about the first thing could be a listening session and that you actually bring in the folks who've been most impacted because we know that the people closest to the problem are closer to the solutions and so I, I'm hopeful that this is a moment I mean one because people are making themselves heard we the protests um, are getting so much attention and we are seeing cities and city councils and different government entities respond. So I think there's, again, that there's this moment where if we seize it and actually lean into it, we can do something drastically different. But I think it requires, you know, nudging people to do something different than what they have always done. You know, I don't think the default is, oh, I should, 
you know, go out into my community, find the organization that's working on the ground, ask, can I have time with them and time with their members? But that's exactly what we need to do. And it's certainly what I'm trying to push in the work I'm doing. Um, I have one last question, I think, and that's just a personal one. Obviously, this work is incredibly personal to you and also incredibly demanding. And I know people are really exhausted for fighting a fight that they keep just feel like they just keep fighting without seeing a lot of progress. And so I wonder just personally, how do you handle the sort of the stress, the physical and the mental stress of your position and what keeps you motivated in this important work? Yeah, I, um, that's such a great question. I, so I personally, I'm an optimist to my core. Like, and I think that is, that is the only reason I could get up and do this work every day is I have to believe that, we, you know, we're not just doing this without believing that we're going to see impact, that there's going to be different outcomes. And I think, again, that's partly why I've, I've come to love data in a new way than I did before I came to Vera is because, you know, I know on the other side of each data point is a person, um, is someone's life who's been impacted by the system. I have felt it personally. I have a brother who has cycled in and out of the system because of substance use disorder. And while he's doing well now, you know, he is always comfortable with me sharing his own story, but cycling in and out of the system never made him better. It never helped him. It always only shackled him with convictions and other obstacles. Um, you know, and I look at my life and opportunities I've had, um, he's way smarter than I am way smarter, hands down. I work harder, but he's smarter. And if he had had the proper treatment for his substance use disorder, if we had done something other than, you know, cycle him in and out of the system, um, I think about like what doors would have been open for him that, you know, really are still closed because he has felony convictions. So, um, so it is, it's personal in that way and recognizing, and he's just a drop in the bucket of the number of the 2.2 million again, who cycling in and out every day of the system. And so, you know, it, I, that is what gets me up every day is that someone's life is, you know, is impacted. Every, and even, and what I appreciate about the prosecutors that I work with, they knew when they were elected, they were taking on a tough job, but they will admit that harm is still being done every day under their name. You know, they're coming in, they're trying, they're, you know, changing policies, but this system that is causing harm is still doing the harm that it does, but now their name is on the letterhead. And so, you know, it just, it's, um, it motivates us and motivates my partners to do everything we can to, you know, change, make this better for the people who are most impacted by it. All right, I think I, I know Jamie has another, um, she's got a program starting right at one. So unless someone has a really quick, I think we're, I think we're basically up against, we're up against the end. And so I just wanna thank her for joining us today and thank you for your impactful work. For someone who I have always looked up to even when you were a student. So I, I really appreciate that you have followed through with your goals of leading a life of service and we're all better for it. So thank you, Jamie. And we really appreciate you spending your time with us today. No, thank you all. And I really appreciated the time. Thank you. And I, I will imagine day. you too. Take care. Bye.